what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel and now welcome back go ahead and hit the subscribe button as you will not be disappointed unless of course your taste level is lacking i don't have the cure for that and i don't know what to tell you to do but as for everybody else happy new year i hope everybody enjoyed their december and their transition into 2024 and i hope 2024 is a little bit more forgiving than 2023 y'all this holiday season i was very sick like from Thanksgiving all the way through Christmas. Christmas day, I planned to go visit with a friend, my family, but I was literally in bed, disgustingly sick, which sucked. But I feel a lot better now. Still a little bit of congestion going on, but for the most part, I feel alive. And now that I'm feeling a little bit more alive, I'm back to talk about another disturbing case. And today we will be discussing the case of Angel Resendez, the railroad killer from Mexico. Now Angel here was born on August 1st of 1959, making him a Leo. And he was born in Puebla, Mexico. Now he is raised by his single mother who was able to care for him until he's about six years old. He is then sent to stay with an aunt and uncle who were more financially stable in their care. He experiences a lot of trauma. They are reportedly abusive to him and the uncle actually begins essaying him. And so at the age of 12, he is returned back to his mother's care. Now, Angel's name suits him, at least right now. He's a very unproblematic child. Rarely does he cause any trouble. He mostly keeps to himself and he seems to prefer that. Now, a little over a year after he is returned to his mother's custody, he is out swimming in a river that is not far from his home having a good old time when a group of older boys from the neighborhood approach him and begin to taunt him. Now this run-in with the boys ends with him being again essayed by the group. I'm not sure how many boys it was but I know it was more than two. At this point he decides that he is not safe with his mother, he is not safe with his aunt and uncle and he decides to flee Mexico and enter the U.S. illegally. He flies under the radar working different jobs here and there as a means to support himself. Four years in, once he turns 18, he begins going back and forth across the border visiting home. Work for him is of course not guaranteed and sometimes there is no work. So as a means to supplement this income loss, Angel here turns in his little halo for a pair of devil horns and begins to steal. Now with his little life of crime, he is caught several times and sent back to Mexico. I don't know if Angel was just starting out or he wasn't that good of a criminal. He is often caught and each time he'll do whatever little time he is sentenced to be sent back to Mexico and then he would re-enter the U.S. using an alias. And this is something that he is frequently doing, like consistently. Angel would sneak onto freight trains and work seasonal farm jobs, travel in the U.S. region to region, chasing crops that are ready for harvest. He'd go live in Florida during the orange picking season. He'd travel to Kentucky during tobacco season to harvest for tobacco farmers. Y'all to Indiana running through the corn maze collecting corn when it's time for that. And in between seasons, he supplements his income robbing people. And it does not take long before his burglary and theft become violent. In 1979, at the age of 20, he is arrested for severely beating an 88-year-old man inside of his home that he was there to burglarize. Now, for this offense, he receives a 20-year prison sentence, but he is released after serving just six years. Now, according to his mother, who he keeps regular contact with, he was again violated by a group of men during this prison stay. It's something that he will talk to her about and cried about it a lot. And she says, that she didn't know what the right thing was to say to him other than Jesus loved him and things would be okay. Now Angel does meet a nice young lady and the two of them get married eventually having a daughter of their own but their marriage does not last long with all of his antics and instability neither do his two subsequent marriages in which he produces two more children. The women were not trying to stick around with Angel and all of his mess okay in and out of prison always stealing. They got tired. After his six years he was returned to Mexico. He eventually makes his way back into the U.S. and decides to settle down in Houston, Texas, where in 1986, he encounters an unnamed homeless woman. The two of them exchange words. He feels insulted and the exchange results in her being shot four times and left in an abandoned farmhouse nearby. Now, unfortunately, at the time that this woman is discovered, local authorities are not able to track down 
on the assailant. And so Angel here is able to carry on as if it never happened. Now, in the summer of that same year, Angel is arrested in Laredo, Texas, when he attempts to cross the border using a fake U.S. birth certificate. For this offense, he is sentenced to 18 months. After serving his 18 months, he is deported back to Mexico. But not long afterward, he is caught fraudulently applying for a social security card. And he is also illegally in possession of weapons. Now, for this, he is, of course, arrested. He is sentenced to 30 months in prison, afterward deported back to Mexico. And by July of 1991, he is free and back on U.S. soil, scouring the Southeast for yet another target. Now, on the still evening of August 29th, 1997, in Lexington, Kentucky, a young couple, 21-year-old Christopher Meyer and 20-year-old Holly Dunn, are hanging out alongside these railroad tracks. The two of them had gone to a college party not far from campus, and the party was a little bit boring. They decided that they would much rather go somewhere where they could be alone, so they pack up Chris's backpack with beers and head down to the railroad track for them to just vibe. They're taking their time, enjoying the weather and each other's company, and then after a while decide that it's time to head back to the party. Now, as they are walking along the train tracks, headed back, still in conversation, from behind this electrical box here is Angel, crouched down, hidden tiger style, waiting on his moment to strike. When they get close, he hops out from behind the box, taking the couple by complete surprise, demanding money. The two of them tell him that they don't have any money. They're just two broke college kids and he does not accept that. He takes out something sharp and he forces Chris down on his knees. He goes through Chris's backpack. He doesn't find anything that he wants and so at this point he decides to tie the couple up. He also gags Christopher and for a moment he goes off into a wooded area nearby. The couple has no idea what he's doing. They are of course terrified and this fear only escalates once Angel returns holding this huge boulder. Angel goes over to Christopher and drops it on his head, killing him. He then goes over to Holly and he proceeds to essay her and she starts to scream. She is fighting him, calling out for help and he warns her that if she does not comply, he will end her life just as easily as he had done Christopher's. At this point, she decides to just wait it out and suffer through. But when he is finished, he takes whatever this sharp tool was that he had threatened them with and shoves it into her neck. He then goes to retreat retrieve this wooden plank which he uses to bash her until she is unconscious and he leaves her there for dead. Now, because this situation with this ambush did not work out as he had anticipated, Angel is still out here looking for money. So he goes and breaks into the home of two elderly women. First, it is the home of 87-year-old Leafy Mason, whom he beats with an antique flat iron like this, not like the ones y'all use to straighten your hair, okay? Afterward, he burglarizes her home, taking any and everything that he thinks is of value. He then travels to Carl, Georgia and does the exact same thing to 81-year-old Fanny Byers. He does not stay in any one place long at all. A week later, he is back in Texas where he claims his next victim, 39-year-old Dr. Claudia Benton. Angel enters her home late at night, eight days before Christmas. And after bludgeoning her using a statue that was inside of her bedroom, he robs her home and he is off to find his next victim as he is far from done. On May 2nd of 1999, he creeps into the home of a pastor and his wife in Weimar, Texas. 46-year-old Norman Cernick and 47-year-old Karen live in this modest little home behind their church, not far from the train tracks where he had attacked Christopher and Holly, the young couple. Angel ambushes them with a sledgehammer in the middle middle of the night. He, of course, robs their home, but before he leaves this house, Angel decides to have his nasty little way with the wife's remains. Mind you, at this time, he is currently in a common law marriage and awaiting the birth of another daughter of his own. And by now, the FBI can tell by the similarities between Claudia Benton and the pastor and his wife that it is likely the same assailant and DNA found at both 
scenes come back as a match to each other, but the DNA does not match any of the victims. So they know that this is the DNA of their guy, whomever he is. They enter the details of both crimes into this database used by a special unit of the FBI that collects and analyzes violent crimes. And it turns out that there are several other crimes that are freakishly similar. Not only were the crimes similar in detail, they had all taken place near railroad tracks. One of which being the case of the young couple, Christopher Meyer and his girlfriend Holly, who had miraculously survived the attack. Holly had passed out, but she had regained consciousness a short time after he had left her there and had managed to stand on her feet and walk nearly 200 yards to a classmate's place to get help. She is the only somebody who has survived him. The DNA from her case also comes back as a match to this unknown person's DNA, confirming that it is in fact this one person responsible for all of this chaos going on. At this point, with her testimony and the DNA, they are able to find out that Angel Resendez is their guy. They just need to catch him. But with all of these aliases, child, it would not be an easy task. The following month on June 1st of 1999, Angel is detained at the border crossing in New Mexico and provides authorities with an unused alias and a different birthday. So they are unable to know that there is actually a warrant out for this man's arrest in connection with a string of murders. They only hold him for a day before releasing him to Mexico. And just two days after that, he re-enters Texas and claims the lives of four more victims within a 12-day period. On June 4th, he attacks a 26-year-old school teacher, Naomi Dominguez, using a pickaxe. He then steals her car, goes about four miles down from where the pastor and his wife live, and using that same pickaxe, he ambushes 73-year-old Josephine. He leaves it embedded in her head. And a week later, Naomi's car is found abandoned on the International Bridge in Del Rio, Texas. Afterward, Angel travels a bit north to Illinois and breaks into the home of 80-year-old George Morber, who was at the time home alone. He takes George out execution style and he is there going through the house looking for things of value, things that he can pawn, sell, or just have. And before he leaves George's home, George's daughter Carolyn comes by to pay her father a visit. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, runs into Angel. He bludgeons her, has relations with her remains, and then takes off in George's truck headed back to Mexico, crossing the border yet again with no problem using another unused alias. At this point, and at this point, Angel is on the FBI's most wanted fugitives list. But with his fake ID, child, he has no problem going back and forth across the border. He is able to cross the border eight times times in 18 months using fake IDs before the FBI realizes that he is down here going back and forth. And this is after there are state and federal warrants for his arrest. His photos are on flyers looking for him. But somehow these fake IDs child allowed him to just skate right on by. And I'm pretty sure the FBI was very much fed up because the LA Times runs a story on Angel misidentifying him as Rafael Resendez Ramirez. So the FBI has to tap them on their shoulder and correct them. But at that point, they're like, you know what? Let's just add that name to the flyers as well. Hell, he might be going by somewhere. Why not? From there, they begin using both names on their wanted posters. It is a super frustrating task trying to locate this man that they know keeps on skating by the border. Their break does not come until they get in contact with Angel's sister and she agrees to work with them to try and catch him. There was a Texas Ranger by the name of Drew Carter who had located her and convinced her to encourage him to turn himself in. And she is actually able to do so. On July 13th of 1999, Angel, accompanied by his sister, his two brothers, and a pastor, surrenders himself on an El Paso border crossing bridge. To see this harmless looking man, Texas Ranger Carter was taken aback. Angel walks up to him looking as nice as can be, shakes his hand, and peacefully surrenders 
surrenders to arrest. His sister is awarded $86,000 for aiding in his surrender. His family believes him to be mentally unwell. They just felt like no one in their right mind would do these things. None of them ever saw the signs and none of them saw him as a violent person. They didn't even think Angel had a mean streak. They were all very shocked to find out that he had committed such heinous acts. Angel enters a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, claiming that he thought he was an avenging angel sent by God to punish those that he saw as evil and deserving. They evaluate him and although he is found to be mentally disturbed, he is not found to be mentally insane. They say that he is very much capable of standing trial, so um, put him up there. May of 2000, his trial begins for capital murder, and his lone survivor, Holly Dunn, comes to court to testify against him, telling her account of that terrible night that she barely survived him, and showing the scars that constantly remind her of that night, as well as the impact that seeing what had happened to Christopher has had on her life since. Angel does confess to all of his crimes in detail, and while he talks about them, he shows no emotion whatsoever. And during his sentencing, he is not spared at all. He is given the death penalty and had reportedly asked that that be his punishment. On the day of his execution, he asks for forgiveness from the loved ones of all of his victims and from God for, quote, allowing the devil to deceive him. His final words are, I deserve what I am getting. And he was given a lethal injection on June 27th of 2006. He was 47 years old on that day. And Sha, I felt like that was too easy. Like he just served only what, six, seven years in prison before they just sent him on to the other side, which is what he wanted. I feel like once he asked for that, it shouldn't have even been an option. Thug it out and rot, okay? That's what I say. But anywho, that is it for today's story. Please let me know your thoughts on this case it is insane how he was able to just pop back and forth across the border for so long playing in their face and i'm also not sold that the lady the unhoused woman that was his first victim i'm not even sold on the story he gave of her insulting him he probably just attacked that lady for no reason um those are just my thoughts i want to know yours please let me know down below like the video if you have not share the video with a friend subscribe to the channel if you have not especially if you're still here. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. So I'm going to, okay. Now, Angel here was born on August 31st. No, he wasn't. He is caught several times and arrested and deported back to Mexico several times. Okay, it says, did I say, did I say several times already? Come on now. And when he, bleh. and when he get back over here, okay, no. He'd traveled to Kentucky working on tobacco farms, harvesting tobacco for farmers. After he was released, okay, 1997 in Lexington. Now, on the still evening of August 29th in 1997 in Lex. Now, on the still evening of August 29th, 1997 in Lexington, I can't say Lexington, Kentucky, in Lexington. Lexington. I can't say Lexington. I can't. In Lexington, Kentucky. Now, on the still evening of August 29th, 1997, in Lexington, in Lexington, Kentucky, hidden tiger style. Was it crossing, crouching tiger, hidden drag? Whatever. He then goes over to Holly and. Pr 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 at that point, she decides to try to just endure it for the moment and or what am I, what am I trying to say? Where he had attacked Claudia, not Claudia, used by a special unit of the, uh, 